Yeah, for me it's live in now in, on YouTube. Okay. Maybe Daniel, if you want to do the introduction again, maybe it's good. And Mervy can start the sequence. Yeah. Yeah, so today we have Mer and also Vinicius and the people from... Okay. from Maybe Daniel, if you want to do the introduction I again, hear myself again. It's good. And Mervy can start. Wait, sorry, I had half echo. Um, yeah, we are joining with the people from Brazil uh, and the TFU from Sao Paulo. And Mer is going to be our speaker. She is a developer advocate at Hugging Face and a Google developer expert. So we are excited to learn a lot from you um, without any further to so we can start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Mervyn. Thank you again for giving this workshop for us. Please uh, feel free to start. Okay. Um, so let me start. Uh, but wait, um, can you, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and then share again the second one. And then I'm going to start, yeah. So hello uh, and welcome to this presentation on uh, NLP with TensorFlow and Hugging Face. Uh, I'm Marve, I'm a developer advocate at Hugging Face and I'm also a NLP researcher in graduate school. And uh, I'm also a global developer expert in machine learning. And um, today uh, I'm going to show you like a very simplified um, kind of like, I'm going to not deep have a deep dive on the NLP, but you know, like how to solve NLP problems in general, how to represent your text, uh, because like it's about the representation. I'm going to show you a couple of architectures, uh, but like some of them are not used today. So I'm not going to elaborate on the ones that uh, are not used today, but the state of the art ones. So uh, NLP as a, as a domain is very, very uh, pretty much same actually with the other domains. Like in, um, in every domain, you try to represent your data as a numbers almost like for instance you have in computer vision you try to represent your data as um you know like pixel values uh like a ma matrix of pixel values sometimes you have like rb rgb images you have um three layers of pixel values in those color intensities in tabular data, you have like categories, you try to represent them as numbers again. In NLP, you have sentences, paragraphs, documents, you tokenize them and tokenization actually looks like this, like you, you just divide your text into small, um, smaller pieces. This can be like subword, um, su meaning like it can be even smaller than the word. It can be pieces of word. It can be the word themselves, or it can be I don't know. Like you don't usually represent your sentence as numbers. Uh, it's usually like you have a mapping of the word to a number so that your model can understand that this number is actually. You know, like in sentiment analysis, for instance, it's the most uh, common problem everyone uh, dives into. For instance, you have the word happy so much and uh, it's associated with the number. And it's also like the ones, the sentences that have happy in your, in your um, examples are mapped to a positive sentiment and your a machine just thinks, you know, like your model just thinks, hey, this word, this this word that is mapped to this number is actually like, I see this number, this might be, this is probably a positive sentiment. 
So basically, we tokenize and we just, you know, map these two numbers and we feed these numbers. And, you know, if we have labels, we feed these labels into the uh, machine, basically, model. But how does the, you know, like this is usually not enough. So a couple of stuff are developed for this. One is word to wake uh, word to wake turns your um, turns your numbers into vectors, and these vectors are more like capturing the relationship between the words. Like for instance, this is think of this as a as a network that is trying to predict. Like you have this, uh, you have these um, sentences. For instance, let's tokenize. Isn't this easy? You try to predict the word tokenize from surrounding words, or you try to predict the surrounding words from the word tokenize. So in NLP, basically everything goes from the co-occurrence of the words. For instance, uh, the, the word going would be more probable than the word go when you see they are. Um, this is like this is how your uh, machine actually predicts things and this is also pretty much the same and i'm going to show you something really cool for a sec uh, i'm closing the the presentation but i'm going to show you the how ve word vectors look like and what do they represent and this is a project of tensorflow and i just love it so much it's so easy to explain um so for instance let's let's search for the word forest and click and the the wait sorry very sorry forest again the word forest is very close to other words like um, pine trees hills uh, vegetation etc because these are usually like extracted from um, you know, like uh, documents with a context, you know, like we see the word forest very often with pine and trees. The algorithm tries to, you know, like um, it, they are very close in the vector space. And uh, this was developed for, you know, capturing the, um, the um, semantic representations, the, the relationship between the meanings of the words. And this, this only not um, captures the semantic representation, but also syntactic representation. Let me show you the classical word to ex, uh, example. Um, just a sec. This one. So like in word to vec your um, for instance, you have king and queen and the word man and woman. And when you, this is the most classical example ever, but when you subtract the vector of man uh, from the from uh, king from the man uh, and add woman, you get queen. Like it rep it's, it, it actually can capture the semantic representation between the words and also it captures you know a syntactic representation you know walked and swam and then walking and swimming it's it also captures these type of representations and also you have like you know capitals of countries this also can capture these kind of representations uh, i'm going to drop the link to the to here so you can play around. Anyway. And um, another thing we used to use was recurrent neural networks. And uh, this architecture is actually, I, I feel like it's a, it's, a, it's a really nice architecture when you think about it. Uh, we have this, um, we have this cell that we, we feed the sequences. This can be any sequence, by the way. This is not limited to NLP, but you can also feed time series data into a recurrent neural network. And also 
as far as I know, audio data or like video is still a, you know, a sequence. So you can feed those uh, data inside as well. And when you look at it, like when you, this on the right, it has the unrolled version and on the left, sorry, on the right, it has unrolled version. Yeah, it, on the left, it has the rolled version. Unrolled version it actually looks like the, just like the uh, feed forward neural network, but it isn't really actually um, like exactly the same with feed forward neural network because you feed the same thing again and again, like you feed the X zero, for instance, the first is the first word in your sentence and you feed it to the recurrent neural network and get the output. And then you get this output and you you feed it again to that neural network. So you get the previous output and you just feed it to a neural network. We will see an animation next. But you just, you know, feed it again to the same thing and you get the, you know, second output and you just feed the uh, second output in the third time step and you get the third output. And uh, this is this helps us handle variable lengths of data as well, because you can feed individual uh, individual data. And um, it is good because in, the, in between the time steps, you have this relationship and you need to still keep that relationship. Thus, you, you know, like you predict something and then you move on and feed the same thing again and uh, just keep doing it until the last word of the sentence. I'm going to show you a quick uh, example next uh, so that you can understand like for instance we have like input characters this is taken from tensorflow and then we feed it to an embedding layer it can be like a word to vec or something like that and then we get the embedding and if we feed it to the uh, recurrence uh, cell it is called gru here don't don't worry about it it's just another you know recurrent cell and then you feed that uh, you feed the output of that cell to the next cell again, and then you also feed that the output of that cell into the uh, dense layer, which is like a classifier layer, and you get the outputs. But you know you just don't throw away the previous input. Like these might seem uh, like in, for instance, uh, in structured data, you have examples, right? And you just predict them individually and don't care about the next example. In here, you just care about the next example, uh, previous example. Uh, you just keep feeding it uh, because you know that there is a relationship between them. And this is, this is heavily used in, for instance, like applications like re uh, neural machine translation. Uh, recurrent neural networks were being used for this kind of tasks like summarization, paraphrasing, machine translation. And here you see like a sequence to sequence recurrent neural network architecture. Like this encoder thing is just an RNN one, RNN, uh, just a recurrent neural network that uh, basically creates a dense representation of uh, a sentence. And then we have this decoder network that we expected to take this dense representation and just, you know, map it to words, you know, just uh, translate. Like we, the encoder part takes the input and, uh, you know, turns it into a vector called context and decoder takes this vector and tries to decode this input into sentences you know, like maybe a translation or a paraphrase, but this context creates a bottleneck. And what happens inside is that um, each encoder unit has one output and one hidden state. And this hidden state is modified every time it passes through the next encoder unit. And by the time it gets to the last one and turns into a context, it remembers the la latest inputs the best and first inputs the worst, as you can remember here. I wish I could point out things. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm just pointing out with my mouse. So basically, I am feeding, um, like I take a character or like a word, 
and I turn it into uh, a vector and I feed it to a recur recurrent cell, okay? And then I take the output, I just, you know, give it to a dense layer and then, you know, I get my predictions. And I give it to the next cell and, you know, the magic happens here and then I do this over and over again, but I am throwing all of these out actually. So by the time it gets to here, it completely forgets about this. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Can I, can you confirm? That would be actually great. Yeah. Okay, cool. So by the time I get to this time step to this word, uh, predicting this word, it completely forgets about this word because these are getting like, I this goes into there and there and there, like every time I, in between, I am carrying a hidden state between these cells and these hidden state changes a lot. So it is, it, it just gets lost, the information gets lost. Like it doesn't know precisely about this in here. I think it was like shown in, like you can think of if you are, working on computer vision it's a bit like resnet like you, it's it's a bit you know like your gradients get um it i don't know if it's a good analogy but your gradients get vanished and you to prevent this you try to just move this uh pre the first for instance first um output of the first uh, node into like uh the later ones directly without doing anything on it in here like this uh this is like this this gets completely forget forgotten and to prevent this we have a solution uh which i will show you but let me i'm going to i've uh i think i've shown this like uh wait um so as you can see, I, I feed the first one uh, into like the first word into the first unit and then I get the first hidden state and then I get, I, I feed this into the second unit and then like I get the, I, I, feed the, I feed the second one and I get the second output, which is like the, which contains some information about the first one, uh, first word and the second word and the third one completely almost forgets about the first word which is like not okay i and they have they have uh, they have proposed a solution for this so i'd like to go through the encoder decoder transformer and uh, like this is this is called an attention mechanism i'm going to explain now so all of the hidden states which belong to each word and of the encoder is passed instead of a single hidden state and then a score is assigned to every hidden state this is like how you calculate this mechanism called attention attention is like you try to focus on the important things and not completely forget about the first word because like in predicting the fourth word for instance you might need information about the first word and uh, you need to you might need to remember about the first word it might be just as important um so we do not throw away these in intermediate representations but we try to you know make use of them so we get all of the hidden states of each word and then uh we pass it like in instead of a single hidden state that gets transformed here uh, over and over again. Like in here, as you can see, we have only one hidden state, which creates a bit of a bottleneck. And um, like in here, we don't really do that. Uh, I'm going to explain how it is calculated, but think of this as basically like we assign a score to each of the words, basically in a sentence on how much attention we should uh, pay to that word in you know predicting something predicting anything basically and then like these um, these go into like we, we calculate the score and these go into a softmax and each state is multiplied with their softmax to amplify the importance of those words basically 
And what's actually happening inside is that we have this uh, attention decoder, RNN taking initial decoder hidden state and the embedding of the end token. And RNN processes these inputs, um, producing an output and the new hidden state vector. Uh, we use encoder hidden states and the new hidden state vector to calculate the context vector and concatenate it with the new hidden state and pass into a feed forward neural network and take the output, which is basically the word predicted. So we basically get those soft maxed outputs, you know, like it's it, because they basically indicate us the, you know, which things we should pay attention to. And uh, we did the new hidden state vector to calculate, we calculate the context vector, like the previous one, we previous bottleneck that we were supposed to calculate and then concatenate with the hidden state and just pass into the classifier. And like, secondly, uh, like this is just what happens. Uh, we need to go through, you know, like attention and how it is calculated. And then, you know, something called positional encoding, like these were introduced after the RNN and these are heavily used in today's NLP. And like we first, we need to get like three vectors from the em embeddings of encoders input called key query and value. And we create them by multiplying the input embeddings of the three matrices we have trained. We calculate the, you know, the scores that I have previously talked about by assigning, uh, you know, the in two inputs by taking the dot product of those vectors and take every word's combinations of keys and queries, meaning we take the dot product of the first query and first key and second first query and second key as uh, just um, illustrated here. And then uh, we divide these scores to not the, not the, let the uh, scores getting ex, um, ex, exploded, I would say. This is just a design decision. And then we multiply each vector with this score uh, to amplify the importance of those words we need to attend to and then sum the uh, weighted value vectors, which is overall result of the self-attention calculation. <clears throat> this might sound a bit of um, a, a alien language, by the way, I would understand because it's hard, but uh, bear with me and we will see the, them in practice and I hope you will understand it better. And this is not even like the main point of this one, uh, this uh, presentation, we will have a hands-on hands workshop. Uh, the main point I would say is the transfer learning itself, the concept of transfer learning and how we can leverage those big models to create a better performing model. So stick with me and uh, I hope you will understand. I'm just giving like a layer of the, you know, like just keep these in the back of your mind. You don't need to like 100% understand what's going on. You can always like go and, you know, like see Google, uh, what, why they have done this, like, what does it mean, etc. So, if, like, the last two things, like, one is multi-head attention, which is, like, uh, we don't want one word to focus on one word, but multiple words, like, we do not want this, like, for instance, in the sentence, like, queen, quick brown fox jumped, it fell, we want what the word it refers to, so, they introduce, um, you know, like the word it actually refers to the quick brown fox. So like it has to like attend those words. So they have introduced multi-head attention and um, it's just uh, self-attention being calculated multiple times and then getting concatenated. And lastly, uh, another improvement done with, you know, the recent architectures is positional encodings. And this is like, um, uh, like it, it's a positional embedding, which is also like introduced in the very early transformer architectures, but not only like BERT and other architectures. On top of input embeddings of each word, we have like a positional embedding that keep the distance between the words and position of the each word, because one word be being mentioned in a sentence in like as the first word or as the last word actually might have different 
meanings when you think about it. So distance between the words and the relative positions of words actually capture a good meaning uh, of in a sentence. For instance, when we have the words they and are subsequently, we are more likely going to have the word going instead of go as the next word. So basically we have, uh, we are keeping the, the uh, position limitings as well. This is like a representation of the BERT, for instance, which is a transformer architecture I will talk about, but yeah. And like for these kind of architectures, you can, like the, the, the reason why I am telling you about this is actually transfer learning. And this is a very cool concept. <clears throat> So transfer learning is basically transferring the information from a big neural network to, you know, like your own use case, actually. Think of this like Facebook, Google companies, like they train a very big model for you and you can make use of the weights of this model without training a model, like without training a model from scratch, I would say. Um, think of a neural network in between you have useful weights and you can just use those weights and, you know, like a put a classifier layer on top. Like for instance, you, there's a model that was um, trained and uh, given to you by Google and you need uh, a good sentiment analysis model with three sentiments, like positive, negative, and neutral. You can take that weights of the model and put a classifier layer on top of three, three output units, you know, like positive, negative, and neutral. And you can just retrain these models, like tweak the weights a little, and by feeding your own, um, your own uh, sentiment analysis data set, and you will have a better performance than what you would have with the with training from scratch actually. So I feel like modern machine learning engineering is a bit of finding a pre-trained model for yourself and just, you know, taking that model and making use of it and not actually train a model from scratch. And uh, this, this process of putting your classifier layer on top and training again is called fine tuning. And this can be done for anything. This can be done for any NLP task. I'm going to get to what you can do with NLP. Like from here, it's more of a practical side. So we have been through the theory, theoretical side. And like, let me just give you a quick um, like information of how you can accomplish this. You can use TensorFlow Hub. And you can also use uh, Hugging Face for this. And this is actually what, we're, what we are doing in Hugging Face. Uh, we basically host those big trained models uh, and we provide you the tools that you can use for transfer learning in the Transformers library. And we also provide the data sets, like for instance, a sentiment analysis data set, a question answering data set, maybe like in different languages in, um, in the data sets library. And these are completely open sourced. Most of the stuff in Hugging Face are actually open sourced. And also we have these Hugging Face Hub, which you can just go over the models and you know pick the task you want to accomplish. And, you know, take the task, take the language you want to work on uh, and filter models, take one of the models, just fine tune it on your own use case and just use it. And I would say most of the times you don't even need fine tuning because someone has already trained the model for you. Like there are tons of models. Someone has probably fine tuned the model that, that was suiting your use case and you can just use it. And I'm going to show you how you can use it with just two lines of code or something. It's, it's, it sometimes feels ridiculous. Like, <clears throat> um, we have also like, uh, recently introduced, you know, like audio tasks and computer vision tasks as well. Um, you can just, you know, go to hub and take a model and call the pipeline function. Pipeline function is some this en big encapsulation that lets you infer with models. Because as I have told you, like 
in the in NLP, for instance, you need to take a, go to the you know like train a model and you know tokenize the text, and then um, it tokenize the text and train a model, and then do this again in the production for reproducibility because your model does not directly understand the words, but those mappings between the words and the and the numbers. So like this pipeline actually encapsulates the whole thing, like the tokenizer and the model inside. Think of it like a box. You just pass your sentence and get the output uh, and, you know, like the ID of the, it even maps the number IDs to the words themselves again. Uh, and for this is same for the other domains, like it's just a big encapsulation that lets you infer very easily with two lines of code or something. And it usually looks like this, like you have, for instance, like what question answering model does is that uh, you can just uh, take the question and you have a document that you are looking for the answer of that question. And then you just pass these two into the question answering pipeline with a model, question answering model of your choice. And you just get the answer basically, like uh, for instance in here, it says, what is the purpose of this uh, quest? And uh, context is the document we want to search in is, uh, adventure is approached by a mysterious stranger in the tavern for a new quest to uh, locate an ancient relic. And the answer is to help lo locate an ancient relic. And this is like done with only two lines of code or something. And you know, like how, how can you use them? So like, for instance, I made a chatbot that answers uh, FAQs using question answering models. Basically, for instance, you have like your customers and your customers are asking the same thing usually, but um, you know, like training a whole chatbot is actually hard. So instead what you can do is like, you have your documents that the answers are located in uh, and you have your um, customers asking you questions and you can take the question and then uh, use the question answering model to search in the search for the answer in those documents automatically and just give the give your customer answer and you don't even need to train a whole chatbot for this and you can also like automate information retrieval like for instance you want to extract uh, names, addresses from invoices, you can just, you know, take a token classification model. It's called token classification because you are uh, classifying the individual words, basically, uh, you know, saying this is a name, this is a city, etc. You can extract information from invoices using like token classification models. And uh, we have like conversational models you can create a fun conversational agents uh just like your movie character you can take uh you know if you want to analyze your customer reviews you can take uh, a tech sentiment analysis model and use text classification pipeline to just you know straightforward to use it and uh So basically, um, you just uh, create. You can just create a, for your first ever machine learning application with only a few lines of code. Uh, you can uh, like pick a model from the hub, pick a pipeline that suits your use case the best, and you will be good to go. I'm going to show you how to do this in the in the um, notebook. So to use the pipeline, just uh, import pipeline from transformers and give the documents that we want to search in and the question we want to search the answer of and we call the question answering pipeline and infer in it by giving the question and the context and we get the answer which here is bird for question answering uh, is the model that is initialized with it's the default model but you can just give the model of your choice uh, when you in the pipeline when you are initializing it so that it will use that model and not the default model. 
And secondly, one of the cool models that people like there is a there is a hype out there is GPT models. Uh, so GPT two, GPT, GPT three models are actually doing text generation, and you can use those like you can use a GPT two model in the hub as well. Like we enable that you can even train your own. Uh, this model basically does completes the text uh, given the previous words. Like for instance, um, a GitHub call pilot does that. Uh, it has a language model in behind. It's a GPT-2 like model as far as I know uh, that, that is called Codex. And this pipeline for instance, completes the text we input and returns the completed text. And default model used for this is actually GPT-2 itself. And we also like, we, we are cooperating with TensorFlow so that you can train your models in a native TensorFlow-y kind of fashion. Uh, we provide you the architectures of, you know, like if a model has come into PyTorch, you can also like convert it to TensorFlow. And in TensorFlow, uh, we, we provide you the architectures themselves so that you can use them to fine tune model or a train from scratch for on your own data set. Like for instance, if you cannot find the language model that suits your problem, you can train from scratch in native Keras fashion. Let's say you need a model that is going to autocomplete the code and you can pick the GPT-2 model config and train it on the model code that you got from GitHub. And um, we have actually done this. It's we have done something called code parrot that can write um, Python code. I can show you later. Uh, in transforms, like we call the PyTorch and TensorFlow models differently because like they have they are different. They are different code. Uh, so we have to call TensorFlow auto model for causal language model. Causal language model in here basically means you know auto complete my code like. I have given you previous words just to complete my my words. It is called causal language modeling. It's, it's just, you know, another name for GPT-2, I would say. And then uh, we call the model itself and, you know, we pre-process our data, which I haven't shown you here, but we set the model hyperparameters and we can just compile and fit like other any other Keras model. And uh, normally like I, you can also like call any Keras um, optimizer that you would like. I just use Adam VPK here because it's comfortable, but like you can use TensorFlow Adam, TensorFlow add-ons, Adam V or like any other optimizer. And if you'd like to fine tune on your task, like for instance, I have given you the example of extracting names, addresses, <clears throat> addresses, um, uh, you know, named entities. These are called named entities, you know, names, addresses, organization names. If you'd like to fine tune your model on a task called like named entity recognition, which does these, you can simply load the data set of named entity recognition tasks. So every task has their own data set, for instance, sentiment analysis, which is going, which we will just go hands on today is evaluated on something called SST2, like Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. And it has like the sentences and they are sent associated sentiments. And you can just fine tune a BERT model on uh, this sentiment analysis mod, uh, sentiment analysis data set so that you, at the end of the day, you can have a BERT model that is going to uh, classify sentiments. So tasks are basically accomplished with their own data sets and your data set might be just even more custom. <clears throat> um, uh, you can like create the optimizer and learning rate schedule by creating call, calling create optimizer, but this is completely optional. Again, you can use like native Keras um, optimizers, loss, whatever, like you can use anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be like hugging face, which I'm going to show you today. It's more 
native. And then you can compile and fit your model like any other Keras model and voila, you will have a named birth model that can do named entity recognition. <clears throat> And most of the people, like the use users of the, you know, hugging face, like we provide scripts, ready to use scripts for each task. And um, it's just uh, like they do not really do this whole thing from scratch, but they just run ready to use scripts and that's pretty much it for them. And at the end of the day, like you just run this and you can just have a model that is going to do the task that you want. And like, I don't know if I can show you the TensorFlow extended today because my other computer is problematic. And currently TensorFlow serving only supports, uh, you know, like not M1, uh, like it doesn't really support M1 at the moment. And like, I usually use the, my other Intel computer to demonstrate TensorFlow serving so let's hope for the best. Uh, I will check again, but um, it's like you cannot the the Docker image for TensorFlow serving is not does not work on M1s, and my only my N1 M1 computer works right now. So let's see if I can do that. You can also like serve these models with TensorFlow serving, and in fact, like you can even convert PyTorch models. Uh, in Hugging Face to TensorFlow and then use TensorFlow serving as well. Like normally you would use all NNX, which is like a shared format for all machine learning models, but sometimes, you know, converting PyTorch to all NNX and then back to TensorFlow or from TensorFlow to all NNX. And then PyTorch is a bit of too much hassle. So because these neural network architectures that hugging face for PyTorch, TensorFlow, and uh, I don't know, you name it, Flux, for instance, like these architectures are pretty much the same. It's, uh, you know, when you do the, when you look at, visualize the graph on your head. So you can actually switch the weights of these, uh, of these architectures, which is like uh, great. Uh, meaning that you can use PyTorch models with in, in TensorFlow. You can just simply can convert the weight. I will show you how to do that. Anyway, uh, you can, you know, use, uh, when you save your uh, model in TensorFlow with, with model.save, you save your model in two formats. Like one is the H5 model, which is the Keras model, and other one is the saved pr model protobuf file which contains the graphs and variables and the skeleton of your model, basically. So the good thing about TensorFlow is that it is seriously really good for production. Like you can take that saved model, use it in TensorFlow Lite, Android applications, the Flutter applications, you know, edge devices. You can use it in TensorFlow JS you know, in browsers, you can use it in TensorFlow serving, you know, serve it like a REST API, just send the request to your model, which, which sounds a bit weird, yes, but like it's, a, it's an API that has your model inside and you send the request to that API. And in API, it just, um, you know, infers your data from the model and then you just get the answer to your, you know, Inf inference the output and back, uh, which is really good actually as a response. So uh, we can like, for instance, we can use TensorFlow serving, create a Docker container based on the TensorFlow serving uh, Docker image and just, you know, serve it. Uh, if you don't know like how images work, it's like layers of like, if, um, layers of code needed to run an application. So for instance, like you have TensorFlow servings image and you put your model on top of it and voila, you have, you have a, your model's application. And let's see an example. We take our model with TF bird for sequence classification, which is a fancy name for text classification, like any text classification, for instance, sentiment analysis. It's just the you know name of the architecture and actually use the PyTorch model, uh, like take go to the hub, take the PyTorch model. And we first 
uh, convert it to the TensorFlow uh, arc, like to TensorFlow, like to take the PyTorch weights and convert it to TensorFlow. And then we save the model as saved model so that we can use it in TensorFlow serving. Uh, and we first pull the Docker image for TensorFlow serving and run that Docker image uh, as a daemon. And then uh, we create a new image by commi committing the container. We put our model inside that. And then, as I have told you, we create a new image by committing it, uh, which is like your model's image basically now. And then we create a new container based on it and we publish the containers, that containers port where TensorFlow serving handles REST API requests to the hosts port and run that container so that we can just send the request to, you know, like to a sentiment analysis model and get the output. And now for inference, we call the tokenizer of the model to pre-process our data and we send the request to the endpoint. Uh, we get the JSON output and we take the output that has the highest score with argmax because it returns a bunch of, you know, like for every label, for instance, like positive and negative, it returns a it returns like a logit and then you have to take the you know absolute score and then take the argmax which means the most probable label in here but it doesn't exactly say the labels it says zero or one which is negative and positive sentiments you need to like you need another mapping for your labels and your from the labels to numbers your model is you know like outputting so we get it from the config file of the model and then we just you know pass the that from id to label mapping the label id and just that's pretty much it it's it says um we have like a, a positive sentiment here you know the sentence i love safe model and lastly, like you can push your uh, push if, if you have trained the model and you want to collaboratively train with other people, you know, so that other people can take your model and just keep training your model. You can push your model to the hub so that another person can take it and, you know, just keep training and you can push like in several ways. But the most carousy way of doing this is push the hub callback uh, and you give your username and model name and tokenizer and the output directory of your model so that it goes there and takes the model from the that directory and call the callback when you fit so that when your training is done, your model is there like it's synchronized every epoch. And like, for instance, if you also use TensorFlow, TensorBoard, if you want to use TensorBoard, you can just fit with uh, like call uh, the TensorBoard callback. And when you push your TensorBoard will be hosted in your model repository. And then we will go to the, we will go to the, um, the hands-on session. It's okay. Yeah, I think so. We can give like a maybe 10, five, five to 10 minutes break, like maybe seven <laughs> minutes of break. If it's okay, because I'm a bit exhausted. Is it okay? Yeah, of course. So we come back at. 11 at 11. Yeah, sure.
We can continue if you'd like. Okay. Yeah, uh, Merve, uh, yes. will you share us your presentation or, or something? Yeah, uh, this is going to be a little bit more uh, interactive. Okay. Uh, let's let's go. So I'm gonna show you TensorFlow datasets and the glue. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's automatically translated to Turkish every single time, and it looks so funny because like it literally means glue, and uh, but this stands for actually a acronym abbreviation. Let me show you uh, glue benchmark. So basically, each NLP task is actually uh, done through a data set and also are evaluated on data set. For instance, when you see the new open papers with code SSD. Mm -hmm. So you might see like in papers with code, like we have a bunch of tasks, uh, so many of them. Let's go like that. Um, we have a lot of tasks for computer vision, like semantic segmentation, in segmentation, object detection, etc. And for natural language processing, we have like language modeling, um, machine translation, question answering, sentiment analysis, so many of them. Like it, these have even like very different uh, domains. And like this is how the modern science actually works like we have benchmarks evaluated on these data sets and new benchmarks are created each benchmark is um, like each model adds on at uh, a better performance on top of the benchmark like for instance uh, there is like coco data sets common objects in common objects i don't know the how what it stands for but it's actually an it started as an object detection data set and currently it is used to evaluate the panoptic segmentation models, uh, key point detection models. Like it has a bunch of different tasks. There is uh, image net data sets. Uh, it used to be a challenge for instance, and currently it is used to, you know, like uh, train a image, uh, like image classification for instance. And for NLP, it is different. We have like uh, different tasks, for instance, question answering, machine translation, and even these tasks have like different uh, variants in their own. Um, and today we are going to do sentiment analysis, which is evaluated on uh, the SST2 benchmark. And yeah, currently the BERT models are dominating the benchmark. So it looks like, let me go to this. <clears throat> and it doesn't, it doesn't do much, but let's go to glue instead. So glue is a family of tasks that involve understanding of language. And these are, we have like tons of them. Like we have a couple of tasks. One is COLA. COLA is Corpus of Linguistic Acceptability, which means like you give a sentence and it evaluates if the sentence is um, grammatically correct or not. We have SST2, which is sentiment analysis. We have MRPC and MRPC has sentence pairs and it's, it tells you if one sentence is a paraphrase of the another or not. So let's see a little bit of examples inside. Uh, for instance, like it is this hat that it is certain that he was wearing. One is acceptable and zero is unacceptable, meaning it's not grammatically correct. We have SST2, which we are going to find you know that uh, model with today. And it is like company once again, dazzle and delight us. It is a positive sentiment. And we have cross-cultural saw paper is painfully formulaic and stilted. It is negative. 
and uh, like it's com it's composed of like two sentiments and like sentiment analysis models are both evaluated on this and trained on this like fine tuned on this data set we have mrpc data set like you can use these models like these models might look actually quite simple but these are these can be used in variety of real world machine learning applications like it tells you if one is the equivalence, like a paraphrase of another, we have sentence pairs and we have like labels of zero or one. I use this like, for instance, let me give you an example. This QQP model can be used like, for instance, if you are making a chatbot and you, are, you have limited amount of data, you can actually use this QQP data set to do data augmentation. And also same for MRPC data set. If you have a a small amount of data and you need like data augmentation you can actually use these models instead of other techniques and these will per, uh, perform better than you know other techniques like you know markdowns etc and this is used if one question is a duplicate of another like it has zero for duplicate and one for duplicate not duplicate and one for duplicate and uh let me give you another example. I'm not going to go through all of this. You can always check them out. A cool one is MNLI. MNLI is this, um, NLI is basically natural language inference. Like think of statistical inference. You have a premise and a hypothesis and you try to see if your hypothesis is right, you know, entailed or not and uh, contradicting or neutral. You have an hypo a hypothesis and you have a premise and you try to see if it's entailing. Like for instance, let me give you an example. Uh, other villages are much less developed, developed and therein lies the essence of many delights. The other villages and settlements are not as developed. So these are not contradicting sentences, for instance. You can see if one is contradicting this is these and two these uh, hypotheses are contradicting or not. One interesting and like another interesting one is QNLI, which is you have a sentence and you have a question, and for zero, you do not you cannot find the answer of this question in that sentence. For one, it's the opposite. For one, you you cannot find it. Like the question, answer to the question is not given in that text, basically. And this can be used for information extraction. Like you can iterate over the paragraphs with the QNLI model. If you want to automatically fill in some forms, for instance, or like if you have a repetitive job that is basically, you know, reading documents always and looking for answer to questions in those documents, you can use this to automatically fill the, you know, sentences that might contain questions. I answer, an, sorry, answers to your questions, basically. And there is a couple of another ones that I will not go over today, but these are incredibly useful in automating boring things with NLP, I would say. The, there are also other benchmarks like Jam Benchmark, which is like a bunch of, um, generative tasks like what is gpt2 is evaluated on jam benchmark let's see um it is in here i will not go through this today uh but we are also serving those benchmarks. Like for instance, this is a summarization benchmark, which has the big text and their summarized versions so that you can fine tune your model on this, uh, on this data set and get a summar summarization model. There are multiple summarization uh, benchmarks. Yeah, as an example. Uh, so let's go through the tutorial. I have actually trained the model beforehand and uploaded it to the hub so that you can play with it. And I'm going to share you the, the link to notebook. And in fact, let me do it earlier. So GitHub. 
so that you can run it in Colab. So in here you will see sentiment analysis with TensorFlow and Hugging Face Notebook. And if you're interested in, we have recently, like in Keras IO examples, we have recently released a tutorial on question answering with transformers as well. I'm going to drop you the link and you can take a look. We will soon uh, release another one on summarization task as well. So not this one, sorry, the other one. So we will use uh, transformers for this and then quickly we will build a Gradio demo uh, for the model because like demos are usually really good. Like I used to, in my old job as a machine learning engineer, I hated building demos for, you know, like you have to create this uh, UI for the clients or like uh, your colleagues so that they will understand it will not be inside Collab. Uh, it is, seriously um like it has a big technical depth because it will not the, this ui this api is not going to even be taken into production probably what matters is your model and you have to create a like you have to spend the least amount of time on your ui and you know showcase to your colleagues but the most time for your model instead so today we will see how to create a demo with radio and if we have time streamlet and you know we can just serve it uh, yeah so let's go through the notebook and then at the end we can see like cool stuff so we have uh, we have to like do a pip install of transformers and data sets this is not this is completely optional this is for uploading your model to the hub um, so that others can actually use it. And in here, like it tells about the, the, the available tasks in glue, but we are only going to use the SST2 task. So good thing is that we only need to, you know, pick the model and the SST2 and we need to just, um, like it doesn't require many, uh, it, re it doesn't require much pre-processing to be honest, because everything is already given. So the Hugging Face data sets, in fact, is a fork of TensorFlow data sets. So if you know how to use TensorFlow data sets, you can use Hugging Face data sets, which is very convenient. This actually loads from TensorFlow itself, like TensorFlow data sets itself. We just define our task, which is the sentiment analysis. And it, you know, every task has codes. And uh, like, for instance, this is sentiment analysis. We have COLA, as I have told you, MNLI. We have the distill BERT model, and it's a BERT model that is a very like much smaller than BERT, but with a cool um, performance because like the smaller your model, the easier you can work on that model. Basically, it's good. And we load our data set with uh, data load data sets from data sets library, and we we say from glue uh, take the SST two siplet because this is a family of data sets. We just take this siplet, which is dedicated for the uh, task itself, and then we pre-process our data. As I have told you, we need to tokenize our data set and map it to the uh, map it to the um, numbers that model can understand. And we basically, we are not going to train a model from scratch, but we are going to take an already trained model, which is BERT. And this BERT model has its own tokenizer. So it already has a, you know, sentence, sorry, word to number mapping. And there in Hugging Face, there is something called auto tokenizer, which basically when you give the model itself, which is we give distill bird here, we tell, hey, bring me the tokenizer of distill bird. And it just brings you the tokenizer of distill bird. And you can give like a, a sentence or pair of sentences. And it's going to map this uh, words into Bert's own mapping according to Bert's own mapping. So for instance, the words here, like 
they are mapped. This word hello is actually mapped to this, and this is mapped to 1010, etc., etc. And uh, this, um, and then let's move on. So our pre-processing function is simply passing the tokenizer, the our data sets. Uh, column that contains the uh, sentences. So basically this, where is it, SST? So basically this sentence contains the examples and label column contains the label. So we are going to pass this whole sentence column into the tokenizer. And we, and then, so basically in Hugging Face datasets, there is this datasets map function that applies that preprocessing function into all of the column or the data set or whatever you want to give to be processed. Uh, and it enables multi-threading as well. And then uh, you can see like uh, in here, it's just a small thing that shows you which columns have been added by tokenizer. It's uh, it's not like a big part of the preprocessing or whatsoever. And then uh, we are going to use something called data collator and data collator basically handles uh, grouping the samples and you know, like each batch of samples uh, together um, and every task has its own different data collators. And in this case, we have this data collator. This is just a pre-processing step. And then uh, we just, so basically in the TensorFlow, there is this um, version, like there is this data set format called TF data uh, data set that uh, Keras models can natively understand. And like, it's best if you convert your data into TF data data set. And to do this, Hugging Face already provides something called to TF data set function. And uh, it has, like, you can just data collate uh, the column that uh, we have just, you know, tokenized the text. We are going to pass that. We are going to pass the label column and uh, the batch size, and then it's going to convert it into a TF data data set. And then we can, from there, we can just fine tune, like this was all that there is, that there is for pre-processing and nothing more. We can just call TF auto model for sequence classification, which is a fancy name for text classification that you can use for like with any glue model, like you can use that model architecture, like uh, the, you know, this basically gets the birth model and puts the sequence classification head on top, which means that it can now do text classification uh, tasks. And these range from, you know, COLA to sentiment analysis. It just puts a classifier layer on top. And we just define our loss and we just uh, define our model with TF auto model for seconds classification from pre-trained. We give the distal word model and we give the number of labels. This number of labels is basically like if you have three sentiments, for instance, what this does is basically it takes the BERT model and it, it puts a classifier layer on top with three output units for your three classes or how many classes that you have. Like in this case, we have only two classes. And then we define the TF Keras optimizer, Adam, like I have used Adam here for simplification and I have given this a uh, learning rate and I have given this uh, like I'm training this for five epochs for sim you know, like simplified example. I will show how to push your model later, but, um, and then I just, I can just call, you know, model that fit. Uh, there are like fancy other features I'm going to introduce now, but uh, without doing anything extra for, you know, 
TensorBoard, other stuff, you know, hosting your model. It's just pretty much it for uh, fitting, like using transformers with TensorFlow uh, and nothing else. And um, like you give your two model fit, you give your data set, like training data set, validation data set, your epochs and the callbacks I'm going to tell you about in a second and just, you know, call model.fit. It's not much different from TensorFlow workflows. You just take the, like the only difference is that you just take the pre-trained models from Hugging Face Hub and put a layer on top of it. And also um, like take your model, uh, take your data set and just, you know, pre-process it to convert it to a TensorFlow data, data set and just, you know, pass them into model.fit and that's pretty much it, not much um, extra work on your workflow. But let me show you a couple of cool stuff that you might use. So if you want your model to be hosted like this, I have trained this model and I have, uh, I'm going to show you how it looks like. So basically, uh, when I push my model on the hub, it automatically creates a nice model card that contains the training loss, validation loss, accuracy and number of epochs I have trained. And, you know, the if I enter, I haven't entered data set here, but it also normally gets the data set. And I have optimizer, uh, optimizers, uh, hyperparameters. I have training results and the framework versions. Like this is done automatically, which is really cool. And I also get to have a nice uh, widget here to test, easily test my model. Like this should be mapped to positive and negative and positive for this and negative for this. I completely forgot to do that, but yeah. Uh, you know, I like you is a positive sentiment. And when I do it, I get like this score for this sentence. I am very happy. Let's see. So if you haven't used a cached, uh, cached uh, example, uh, it's going to load your model and uh, use that, use your model. Otherwise it will just use the outputs of the cached, cached example, but the model is a bit big, so it takes a little time. Yeah, again. And uh, we have um, like TensorBoard, push TensorBoard traces so that they are hosted here. Like if you have pushed your TensorBoard traces, it's I think it's really cool. And we have our model, files. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use this in transformers, but you can also call pipeline function to directly use it, which is really cool in my opinion. Anyway, so to push this, push your model. Uh, so we support the Git large file system repositories and Colab doesn't natively support uh, LFS. So you need to install Git LFS. And then uh, you need to create a Git LF, you need to initialize it and then uh, log into the Hugging Face CLI, which takes you here. And in here, I have my uh, authorization tokens, access tokens, meaning that, hey, it's me, you know, just let me push my model. And then uh, I can just, you know, like I can do everything from callback. Like if you, I don't know if you have used uh, Keras callbacks previously, we have like early stopping. We have, you know, learning plateau. We have like TensorBoard. We are going to use TensorBoard and we have, we, we are going to use like two callbacks that we have written in um, Transformers. So first is Tensor. TensorBoard, it's not nothing. Basically, you give the logging directory and it creates your TensorBoard logs inside here. And for we, we are going to push our model to the Hugging Face Hub. So we create the output directory. Uh, we give the tokenizer and we will give the, um, you know, like I want to host my model here. So I give the name of it. 
you know username and the the model um, name and we and lastly we have a nice callback which basically uh, trains your model and at the end of the every epoch it will prompt my custom metrics because in NLP we have like very custom metrics like let me give you an example normally like in other machine learning models we have like accuracy f1 score etc like we are all also using these in NLP in classification problems like text classification but we have also other scores like for instance we have rouge score which is like you have a text and you have the summarized version you need to detect the overlap between the and you know like the shortened version of the ground truth of the summarization like um, the actual summer summarized version and your summarized version and you need to see the overlap between them so that it's it's a good way of evaluation of sequences basically we have blur score which is used for translation models um, to you know prompt every single you know like custom metric at the end of each epoch you can use this uh, Keras metric callback we have written. Uh, it has this metric function uh, that is written in here. Uh, and you give your evaluation data set and you pass all of your callbacks into model that fit and it's going to do, uh, you know, things for you, like whatever you want them to do, basically. Let me quickly see, like, I have previously ran this, so no, I didn't run it. But like in the repository, as far as I know, it's it is previously run, so you can see how the Keras metric callback looks like. I didn't want to train and push again because I would lose time. But after the epoch ends, it it says you know like accuracy is this, for instance, because in text classification problems we are basically using accuracy. And when you fit the model, it will push your uh, it will push your stuff to the hub, and you other people can see your model's hyperparameters, metrics, uh, the tensor board, and everything uh, like this, which is I think really cool. And it has like bunch of tags so that people can actually see, um, just um, use. Uh, use these tags to uh, filter to find your model. For instance, we have blue. Yeah. And um, so uh, let me continue. So I can directly load my my uh, this from the hub and directly do inference on it. I'm gonna say in load trans from transformers load pipeline and then I will initialize pipeline with my own model. Uh, as, I, as you see, I give the task name and I give the model name uh, and it is going to download the model for me and prepare the pipeline. And then I call this text classification like it can be called anything. And then I give my, um, I give, I love hugging face and it tells me the score is this. Because this model is like poorly trained, like I didn't even do any hyperparameter optimization or I have trained it for two epochs. Like this is very little, uh, it doesn't perform well, but it's trying its best. And then I'm going to build a nice um, nice UI with Gradio quickly here and then show you other couple of other cool stuff about building a UI for your machine learning model. So let's uh, install Gradio and I'm going to tell you how to build a model UI.
So basically, even you like your UI can even run in the uh, in the in the uh, collab because my collabs team is uh, a bit of synth wave. It's it looks bad, but like basically, what I'm doing is that I say load the interface model on hugging face normally like it doesn't always uh, work for other um, model registries that but only for hugging face like you put hugging face slash uh, in the beginning of the model name and it will know that it's it's going to fetch the model from hugging face and then I say uh, like you know I'm going to hint this for the users so that they know what to enter to my model and you know this is another parameter for the team like it, it creates the blue button and nothing else and then i give a title for my model and a nice description for my model and it, for the ui sorry and uh, a description for the ui and just launch the ui and it creates the a ui for me this looks really bad i know it's because of my collab team i'm sorry but when I say, um, I love Gradio, let's see. It is going to infer from my model and put the output here. Let's check. And then we can see a couple of other nice UIs uh, for models. It shouldn't have taken too long. Maybe it's because it's on collab normally in spaces. Yeah, it runs better. So it says, you know, this is positive with this probability. And you can just, you know, like if you don't want to deploy this using a couple of, you know, production tools, you can just use, you know, hugging face spaces, which I will show you a couple of other examples with streamlets as well so basically spaces is a free for all place to demo your uh, machine learning models and uh, we support both streamlit and gradio and i'm going to show you two nice applications maybe a couple more and how to write them um, let me show this one and lastly let me show write with transformers so write with transformers let me So basically, this write with transformer was just a web app by Hugging Face. And uh, this was like, back in the day, it was my favorite ever application. So I decided I can just reproduce this on my own using Streamlit. So for instance, we have GPT-2 and I can write stuff in here um, and just ask it to the autocomplete uh, the text. For instance, let's say I love TensorFlow because, and then hit tab and it's going to give me like three uh, most potential uh, completions. Like let's say this and then just, you know, hit tab again. The support from Google to share, blah, blah, you know, just hit tab and in text generation models, you have like different parameters to introduce randomness into the completions. Like for instance, we have temperature, which you might have seen, like if you ever used LSTMs, uh, more temperature you have, more random you're going, your model is going to sound like. We have a sampling parameter. Uh, I'm going to like, I can post a good blog post on, you know, how the sampling is done in the decoding phase of these um, generative models. But this is also another parameter for randomness and it's all you need to know, like, like it's going to be even more random and it is not going to sound like realistic the more I in, uh, increase the temperature and yeah. So basically I have decided I can reproduce this using Streamlit. 
and let's see how I did that. Uh, not this one, but this one. I'm also going to introduce you to the code of this UI. So basically, this is not exactly the most similar thing ever. Uh, it's just, you know, like a UI. Uh, whatever I enter here and autocomplete, it is going to appear here, basically. And it has a nice description and uh, a sorry title and a description. And I'm taking a couple of the parameters here. Uh, stuff like that. And let me show you how I did that. So basically, uh, Streamlit helps you do this. And let me show you, quickly show you the Streamlit page. It is one of my favorite libraries and it is so cool. Uh, uh, it helps you uh, build um, data applications real quick. And also this includes machine learning applications, but it's not like, um, it's very, very flexible. It has awesome third party components for different use cases. And, uh, but it's not like, uh, like in, in Gradio, for instance, it is incredibly encapsulated and not that flexible, but with two lines of code, you can just create a UI. But in Streamlit, you have more flexibility but you end up writing more lines of code. So I would suggest you to use Streamlit for flexible data applications and machine learning applications. And for if you want to create a very quick UI, use Gradio instead. Um, so let's see, like for instance, we have one for interacting with molecular structures. We have uh, visualization applications, profiling applications, like this, this uses Bokeh. And uh, what else? We have charts, we have a drawable canvas that you can use for, you know, like you can put an inception classifier in the background and draw stuff and just let the model predict what you are drawing, which is fun. What else? It, there is too much of them. Like for instance, there is a web art RTC one which helps you uh, do real time video classification, for instance, like in object detection, etc., in the browser. And we have like Spaces own uh, package. It, these are really cool. We have pandas profiling. This used to be my favorite package, by the way, like when I was a data scientist. Uh, anyway, you can use, you can just use uh, the, like, it, it's not only this, by the way, these are just, you know, featured ones I have shown you, but I'm going to show you how to write your own with a uh, hugging face and uh, streamlets. So basically, uh, this is purely for educational purpose. I could have used the pipeline as well, but for this one, I have written things from scratch. So I call, I'm going to use GP2, GPT2 large for this application. And I call the tokenizer of GPT2 large. So whenever I enter text here, it is going to be tokenized and passed to the model. And in the, I load the model as well here. And uh, I just call the load model here. And then I'm, I have written an inference function which is going to take these parameters and uh, the model text, uh, the, the text I am given uh, to the model, like whatever I want to infer. Uh, this text is encoded here by the tokenizer. Like I am converting these text into numbers, basically like tokenize them. And I pass it to, I, I pass it as a uh, like, I, I, I say these are input IDs and I pass it here, you see. And I am passing these parameters here, but let's see how I did that. So I write Streamlit title, which is for the title of the UI. And then for this, you can use st.write. And I make a prediction 
which the by the uh, you know like the input of this um, input of this text box and uh, the parameters I got and I get the parameters from here and also the input texts from here. So Streamlit text area helps you uh, input text and when you say send assign this to send basically this means that assign whatever you have written in here to a very you know string called send so you can just use this and just tokenize that and just um infer and the output of the you know other parameters in here are used in in a sidebar with a slider uh, so this is the slider so yeah this is the slider for instance and you can define the you know name of the you know like what is going to be written here the minimum value maximum value the step it is going to in, uh, increase or decrease you can like if you have discrete values you can also get uh, the input number input um, component of streamlet here and i just pass it to infer and uh, gets the basically the autocompleted text and i say st.write the you know generated text so let's see like i am let's say my name is Marve and I and hope it's not something I'm a professional photographer I've been shooting for instance like this is a random text so this is like a very simple application you can do let me show you another thing uh, like a cool one uh, this is done with Gradio and I just love it. So basically, there is a model called T5. Uh, T5 it's developed by Google. So basically, uh, let me explain quickly. So we use BERT model. It, it basically encodes our text. And then, you know, there is a classifier layer. We pass our encoded text into that classifier layer and get output. And this is used mainly for the classification problems, like understanding problems, understanding what is going on with the text. Or like, for instance, if you have a question answering application, you have to see which words contain your answer. You can also use BERT for this. And there is a model called T5. BERT is like, uh, encoder only model and there's a model called t5 which is an which contains an encoder and a decoder like the architecture i have shown you today that has attention mechanism and the t5 model can do everything basically it can do summarization it can do paraphrasing it can do translation uh it is a text-to-text -text model it is called text-to-text -text. yeah and uh, it's like you enter a text and you get a text and how it works is that um so you give the the prompt at the beginning like when you say translate english to german at the beginning of the of your text input it will understand that it has to translate and it will output the trans translation for instance if you say summarize this text uh, and then put the text you want to summarize, it is going to give you the summarized version. So it has like, it can do a bunch of tasks uh, and you only enter the, you know, the, the task that you want to accomplish. And that's pretty much it, nothing else. So I have made the T5 playground and this how it works is very simple. Let me show you. So essentially I only have a model, right? And what I want from model depends on the prompt I'm entering. So what I did basically is that um, I, 
I, I am defining the title of the application, the description of the application. I am defining some uh, examples. I want to uh, show the user and uh, I have my output. I have this input box here and I can pick the tasks. And when I pick the task, it will just prepend the text with the according uh, with the associated task. Yeah, you know, like when I say translation, what it, what it does is that it basically puts translates and uh, dots at the beginning of the input. So I will say summarize this text, you know, like it's about TensorFlow. And let's see what is going to output. Maybe I should have cached. TensorFlow is a free and, op free and open source library for machine learning and artificial intelligence. It didn't complete well. And when I say translation, like this translates from English to German, uh, it translates this into the German language. And when I say, you know, I went to market and that and nothing else, and I ask, you know, like just assess the linguistic acceptability of this um, input, it will say unacceptable. And there is also a question answering one, like what is meaning to life? And I give the answer of the question and it will just uh, extract the exact answer from the documents. And how I did it is that, so I import Gradio and uh, I input inputs from Gradio and I have used pipeline function for this. So basically I initialize text text generation pipeline, which is used for T5 like encoder decoder models for GPT-2 model, it's text generation because it only does auto completion, but for T5 models, it outputs a whole new text. So it has a different pipeline and I give the model itself and I give the task dictionary, which contains my prefixes to the tasks. And I have written an inference function uh, that says, you know, like, by the way, you don't have to only use these tasks, but any other task that you want, like you can directly write here. For instance, there's this cult task called uh, semantic textual similarity and it says STSP. You know, I can give like two texts. I like you. I love you. I wonder if it's going to work. It's just so random. Maybe I'm doing this wrong, but let's see. This is other so that it is not going to prepend my text. And it assesses the similarity between two, two texts, but I didn't like, I have probably written the prefix wrongly, so it couldn't do that. Anyway, um, so I have um, uh, you know, a, a one for uh, any other task that you want to accomplish. And for question answering, it just, uh, you know, gives question and the context, like it's, it's a different way of uh, prepending the text, but for the rest, it just puts the prepend prefix and then the input. And then I just return the generated text part of the output. It returns a dictionary and it has a part called list of ticks actually. It has a part for generated text and I just get this generated text. And I launch my interface, like I initialize Gradio interface. I give the function here and the title and the inputs, which is a text box and the drop down menu containing my tasks. And it is, it has an output of the text box and the description, I gave a description and I gave the examples to, to help the users. And I call launch on this uh, interface and it, it will call, it will launch the interface and I will be ready to use it. And it also has the linked models that you can go to the model by the way and it has a T5 model by Google. Let me show you like a quick 
computer vision, a couple of nice computer vision examples as well. Uh, I feel like they are more interesting than NLP UIs. Uh, Mer, sorry, yeah. this is a question in the chat. Um, they're asking if the if this model performs better than a specific one, like one that does only one task instead of. Uh, like, I would suggest you to not use this if you have a specific model on a specific task. Like, for instance, we have Opus models, like trained on Opus corpuses. Opus is like this. Ser um, collection of corpuses between languages like from Turkish to English from Italian to German like it has pairs of uh, date like languages let me show you quickly Opus data sets and the models there yeah, we, we directly have the models anyway so this will perform these models will perform better than t5 model you know, like you prepare T5 model saying translate from Chinese to English, this will perform better because this was specifically trained on it. And T5 is more gener general kind of model, so I wouldn't suggest you to use T5 if you have a very specific uh, use case, especially some of the low resource languages like Turkish, they are not that, uh, how can I say? Uh, they do not have much data and therefore uh, T5's own training data does not contain that much Turkish to English data, for instance. So it will not be able to perform well. So I would suggest you to use these models in short. Do we have any other question? No. Okay. So if we have a nice one, let me see. Okay, we have a nice neural style transfer one. So basically neural style transfer is a computer vision application. You have an image, content image and the style image and it transferred the style of this image to this image. So like, for instance, you have your own selfie and you want like it to be drawn like Van Gogh actually did it. You can use neural style transfer models. Like for instance, we have a bridge and we have the, you know, great wave of Kanagawa. And it will be, it will look like as if Kanagawa, it, uh, the, painter of Kanagawa has actually drawn it. And this one is a classic Van Gogh. And yeah, it looks like this. I think it's pretty cool, by the way. And this one, this one was actually done by a model from TensorFlow Hub, which is really cool. So in, in the, for this, we have the, we load the model with TensorFlow Hub from TensorFlow Hub itself by calling hub.load. And then we have a function for the, for the neural style transfer itself. And then we just, <clears throat> we define the input. Like we have two inputs here uh, and we, you can also define shape so it resizes and uh, you have like content image input, style image input, uh, the input boxes over there. And you have your examples and you have like, you give the function, you give your inputs and description, blah, blah. And then you can just launch it. And then it will launch this for you, which is like with a few lines of code, you have a UI. I think it's really cool. So I don't think like I will be able to uh, show how to, um, how to do the, the TensorFlow serving today, because as I have said, I have problems with my other computer, but let me send you a nice blog post that already does what I am doing uh, with more, even more details. So, and you can try it for yourself. 
<clears throat> yes, this one. So this is also applicable for any other TensorFlow model and as well as the TensorFlow models on Hugging Face Hub uh, and also PyTorch models, as I have told you. So I see a question, in your opinion, what are big open challenges in NLP? Nice question. Let me think. Uh, so basically, I think that those encoder decoder models except for t0 like this is my favorite you can ask about anything to t0 this was developed by uh, big science uh, let me share my screen again this is seriously really cool i'm a big fan so t0 is like a t t5 like model but in t5 as you remember we had prefixes and those prefixes affected the models output a lot and it gives you a limitation but in t0 you can enter like freestyle text and it will just do whatever you want like for instance it can solve logic puzzles uh like on the shelf there are five books gray book red book purple book and it describes the positions of the books and then it asks which book is the leftmost book and it will say black book it will it will say like instead of saying paraphrase and dots you can just you know give two sentences and ask if they have the same meaning or you can ask like in different ways and it will still answer nicely like it will still tell you hey like this is the answer this is this was needed to be honest like you can say is this review positive or negative and you write the review and it will tell you the post you know like the sentiment like this is the coolest model ever and i wish like every model was like this i i asked about stuff the other day like even you know like it answers the questions like geeky questions like like it, it can even talk do you like star wars prequel or sequels the most let's say this like it will just <laughs> it will even talk so in my opinion like previously this was by the way this is like 16 times smaller than gpt3 and like has less vulnerability against the prompts because it was trained off a very big variety of prompts and uh i feel like the biggest problem is uh you know like training bigger and bigger models that you create an api solution and you know like this is i feel like this is against a bit of democratization i feel like the models should be smaller and smaller but even more capable so that uh, you can just uh, use it wherever you want. Um, I think this trend is not good, but this is my opinion. And people might say bigger models are better, but I don't believe that. Uh, what we need is like better architectures. And this is what BERT has shown us because they have introduced attention. They have introduced uh, position length codings and other smart tricks to make the model even better and you can even make it smaller later i would say this and the second one is definitely res low resource languages and the research on that because the advancements the benchmarks are always on english and we are not like these low resource languages have very small data and they are not that improved and they are even harder to tackle mostly like there are morphologically rich languages like Finnish or Turkish like uh, for Turkish we have like very small amount of data it's very rich morphologically it's hard to tackle and lastly I feel like semantic representations are a bit overrated you know, like the co-occurrences between the words doesn't always work that well. It, it currently it works well and it still impresses me, but I feel like we need something even smarter than this. Uh, there is another question. What if 
to perform a fine tuning on a NLP model, the data to train is not enough. Is there a way to perform data augmentation like adversarial attack? I don't know like how you can augment the data with adversarial attack, but like I have suggested that you can use a model like MRPC or QPP to augment your data. Like currently I have, I am using, for instance, for Turkish, we don't have a QNLI benchmark. I am using the models like translation API in Google Cloud Platform to translate the English QNLI to um, Turkish so that we at least have a data. You can also, if you, if your language is, uh, if your task you want to accomplish has data in English, you can also augment through translation as well. How does an overfitting model look like in applications? Like what output should, could indicate it is an overfitted model? Good question. We usually understand it from like, um, if the model always outputs the same tokens, like this is seriously possible. For instance, there is a Dialog GPT model and the Dialog GPT models I see on the Hugging Face Hub are sometimes seriously overfitted to the dialogues. They train this basically the difference between the regular GPT and Dialog GPT is that Dialog GPT in Dialog GPT you have conversation turns like you can take them from movies like movie scripts and then uh, you can use it to train a GPT-2 kind of architecture and it becomes a chatbot basically. And let me show you a quick example of uh, how an overfitting model looks like. like there is something genuinely problematic uh, on some of them. Let me go to spaces maybe. But this one directly uses Dela GPT. And I don't want to like discourage anyone. So it's best I, if I don't show them because the user's nickname and the model itself is shown. But I would say it is, you know, the repetitiveness in the uh, output might be a problem. And the problem actually might not even be the overfitting itself in that case, but the, you know, the decoding parameters I have told you. But, still the problem still might be the overfitting if the model repetitively says the same thing and also you can see if the your classification model for instance if the sentiment analysis model always predicts you know positive this might even be an indicator like it really depends on the task you want to accomplish i guess but this is just an opinion i I am like, uh, I need to see even more models uh, in production. So is there any other questions? No problem. <laughs> Like you saw in the, in the sentiment analysis model I've shown you, if you train it like 10 epochs or something, you will see that the probabilities of the positive and negative sentiments are incredibly different. Like for instance, in here, I have shown you, it's like around 0 0.57 positive to, you know, 0 0.30, 43 negative but when you train it for even longer you can see that it will become like 0 0.99 positive and 0 0.01 negative because as you train it it performs better like you can clearly see the underfitting i guess but for overfitting i have to test for i would probably test for the class that uh I don't know, like the, the, the repetitive class and the other class and see, you know, like compare. 
and the, you know like the if if i have the ground truth and see how it performs but we don't really evaluate on uh, the loss and everything itself i mean loss is a good indicator but there are like as i have told you some calculation methods like the overlapping tokens number of overlapping tokens and everything and lastly let me show you something um so basically we have recently introduced something called tasks and if you want to like build a machine learning model it's um it's good to uh like get started with tasks let me show you there like for instance if you want to do if you want to extract information from invoices the task you need is token classification and it shows you how to use like the pipeline for this quickly and also uh, how to use it with the other lang libraries that we support, like we support Spacey, for instance. And also it's, uh, it also has like tutorials if you want to train one from scratch. It has a widget, it has metric explanations. It has the data sets used for that task. It has like, um, for instance, for text classification, so many task variants, right? Like NLI, uh, Q, um, QNLI sentiment analysis. It has the use cases and, you know, like again, metrics and um, how to train one from scratch. So you can get started easily if you want to do that if you want to build a model you can just go over there and just see so i think i i am done today if you have any questions oh i'm currently at the university what is the path to become a researcher on nlp so i'm not a quite a, you know experienced researcher i'm also in graduate school and my thesis is on nlp and I could say, like, um, I like I cannot give like nice advices on research, uh, but yeah, like research as much as you can. I mean, just read. So, like, reading papers actually helps me so that I can see what is lacking in the literature, and actually ask that question. You know, like being a researcher is asking that question ask that question and just you know work on that question i would say but i i am in no place to actually give advice <laughs> uh, in in research because it's it's there is not a single answer for that same with engineering like how you can become a machine learning engineer Uh, if you have questions, you can ask from this link and I will answer. We have a Discord server and you can just ask NLP TensorFlow related questions and I will answer over there. And uh, yeah, I think the workshop is done. Sorry, I couldn't uh, I couldn't do Docker because like I, I could do it in the other TensorFlow research at user groups workshops but this time it, it, i was jinxed i guess i couldn't uh my my computer is like acting a bit weird so it doesn't really work well so i couldn't do that but the blog post is actually like everything you need so yeah but it's fine i think it was pretty pretty good i learned a lot i don't know if yeah. it helps also learn a lot but it's i think i like it a lot I don't know, Vinicius, if you want to say something. I just say thank you, Merve, again. Thank you for Very hosting nice. me. Thank you. See you then. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.